Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to church. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here with us. Uh, man, tonight's, tonight's worship was, was so timely. It is, it is amazing to see, uh, you know, just the church sing out, you know, uh, in, in agreement together. And, and I want to just tell you, right, if you, if you have been plugging into what God is doing, I'm telling you for sure that he is building this church stronger and deeper. Amen? Amen? Amen. Uh, you, you, we have entered 2023. We have entered into this time where, where we've got so many possibilities and so many opportunities to kind of really just dive in and do church together. And uh, over, this next, over these last couple of weeks, you know, we have been having this conversation about our core values and Abby kind of set it up uh, so well. We, we are in week three of our core values. And uh, if you're here with us for the very first time, uh, we want to welcome you. Thank you for being uh, with us in the room. Thank you for doing church with us. Uh, we, we would love to get to know you. We'd love to get to, you know, journey with you as much as we can. And uh, for those of you, you know, uh, who have been kind of tuning in week in and week out and being here in the room, it's... It's, it's been a good, uh, okay, this is at least what I believe, uh, you may differ, but I think it's been a good three weeks where the Lord is really stirring something when it comes to our values and what we stand for, amen? And, and uh, tonight, right, even as we continue our conversation uh, on, on, on our value, of third value of uh, disciple making, you know, we're, we're, we're going to be diving in straight to it. I want us to uh, go straight to the Word tonight uh, because there's, there's quite some ground that we would love to cover tonight. So there's this, there's this scripture, you know, where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. And uh, I, I heard this in, in different ways. And uh, if Paul, somebody, somebody said, if Paul were alive today, the church of today would be getting many letters. Do you guys agree to that? If Paul was alive, maybe he would be doing a, a whole bunch of Zoom calls with us. You know, from wherever he's touring, wherever he's going and, and setting churches, maybe one day he'd be in Singapore, maybe one day he'll be in Dubai, the other day he'll be in London, Paris. But if he was alive today, he'll be like, man, you guys need to get on this Zoom call because I've got stuff to talk to you. Anybody would love to be in a Zoom call with Paul? Okay, two hands, not bad. Because the rest of you know that when, when Paul spoke, he didn't mince words, right? He, he, was, he was like straight to the point. He knew exactly what the Lord was putting on his heart. And, and it's in one of those occasions where he decides to write a letter to the church at, at Corinth. And 1 Corinthians, uh, he kind of gives a, a very honest thought about how uh, he, he, he believes that the gospel has impacted his life. Let's, let's read 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. Now, now this is a key that, that I hope we can focus on as well. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but come on, complete this verse with me, but on God's power. But on God's power. Now, now I know Paul is, is not known to mince words, but I was like, Paul, you, you're kind of making yourself a bit too humble. When, when he says that he comes with weakness, when he says that I don't preach to you with any kind of wise or persuasive words, because if you know anything about the life of Paul, he was one of the brightest students when it, came, when it came to studying the law of Moses that was given to the people of Israel. And so he's kind of humbling himself, and, and it makes you wonder that what, 
would really humble an intellect who has been who has been one of the brightest students of the of the best teacher that was ever there during those times and paul was that student and yet he says that my message and my preaching is not with wise and persuasive words but with a demonstration of the spirit's power church even as we dive in to to talk about disciple making i want us to kind of really start off this conversation to help each one of you understand that if you have experienced the gospel message of Jesus Christ are those people there in the room tonight right can i see a show of hands if there are people who have experienced the gospel of Jesus Christ the good news of Jesus the the hope of Jesus the love of Jesus the peace of Jesus because let me tell you this the challenge with us as a post modern church that is doing life in 2023 and that is going to do life beyond 2023 is that we long for way too much information we we want we want way too much knowledge we want way too much information we want everything to be at our fingertips and 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 while google is there the next thing that has come up is open ai has anybody tried that out so far chat gpt open ai how many of you have been having conversations with 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 open ai anybody All right for those of you who are who who are wondering what this is you know the internet is kind of moved to a next level where the artificial intelligence is now come to a place where you can ask for something and this is another world in another world they will say this is plagiarism at its best because you can ask the internet for anything uh, for, for that uh, for that feature or that how do i say it uh, for that ai for anything and then you know it'll just give you a full written things now i tried it while i was preparing for for tonight's sermon i told ai hey write me a sermon on disciple making <laughs> and i am not kidding it actually wrote me a sermon on five points of how to be a disciple of jesus christ now god is my witness none of those notes are here <laughs> because I made sure I took time to pray and 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 prepare so that we can dive into the word of God. But 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 the point is we are in this world where we're filled with knowledge, we're filled with information, but yet we really don't long for experience. We really don't dwell on the very experience of the transformative power of of the gospel because Here's something that we really need to cement in our hearts church that the message of the gospel is not just information but a trans but a life transformative journey. Somebody says it's not information. I hope there are that the people in this room have not gathered for good information. Because you can get it you can get it at the tip of your fingertips wherever you are. information knowledge is available to you but the beauty of 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 receiving christ the beauty of of uh, um experiencing jesus in a room filled with disciples and believers is a whole another thing that goes beyond information and and for the transformative gospel to have its place in our life discipleship is the real key for the gospel message that is the power of god to have its daily impact in our life discipleship is the key and last week if you if you were here in the room we were talking about how jesus teaches us to build community you remember those three simple thoughts that i shared with all of us right to find a table to stay at the table and to learn how to go out there and and lay a table for other people as well. And Jesus teaches us and models so well how to build a God-centered community. But it just doesn't stop there. The very purpose of of Christ coming on earth was to help the people to really start living in the likeness of God. To really understand what that life looks like to really dive in and understand what a life in Christ looks like and and it he desires that it helps us to live in God's likeness because that is how you and me have been created we were made in the image of God we were made in his likeness and when Christ came he desires that you and me come back to that place where we can start living in God's likeness 
And, and the kingdom, I, I say this always, that the kingdom that Jesus came to build was not a kingdom that the, that, the, that the Jewish folks thought that the Messiah would build. For far too long, they were, they were caught up in slavery. They were caught up in bondage. They were caught up in so many different uh, 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 bonded seasons or years of their lives. They, they, they thought that when the Messiah would come, he would come as a military ruler. And that's the kind of king that they were expecting. And then Jesus throws a googly at them and then he says, I am the Messiah. And they're like, okay, how is this going to work? Because we thought, we thought you are here to turn the kingdom upside down. He said, yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. Because the kingdom that God was talking about was a kingdom that was not had. It was not just of the physical realm, but he was here to upset the kingdom of the spiritual realm. So that we don't have to live in darkness. We don't have to live in despair. And that is the kingdom that, that Christ came to model. And when we are talking about discipleship, right? He, he desires. Okay, let me, let me put it this way, right? When I got saved, when I was a, my, my grandmother helped me coming to faith. Shout out for all the grannies. Anybody is a granny's kid over here. You know, grannies are the best. You know, they know how to love you. They really know how to take care of you, pamper you, and kind of spank you at the right time as well. Uh, you remember those spankings you got from your grandmother? Oh, you got it from your mother, father, anybody. But I remember when I got saved, my granny really helped me grow in faith. And at that time, there was this, there was this idea that I gave into. I don't know if you kind of gave into that idea. That you need to get saved just so that you can go to heaven. Where's your ticket to heaven, guys? All those guys who just wanted to get saved and then, I want to just be in heaven, man. Like this world is too much of a messed up place for me. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus. I've been washed clean. And now all I want is heaven. But how many of you know that Christian life doesn't work that way? Right? And, and I gave into this idea that, okay, now that I've gotten saved, now that I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Messiah and the Lord and the Savior of my life, I'm going to go to heaven. I, if, if people around me get saved, that's good. I know I'm going to heaven for sure. And then Jesus was like, no, 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 that's not how it works. That's really not how it works. Because I want you to know this, right, that Christ's purpose was not, is not limited to saving you just from sin. Amen. I'll say that again. The purpose of Jesus dying on the cross is not just so that you can get saved from sin. His desire for you is not just so that you can be content that when you get saved, you're going to go to heaven. He desires something way more than that from your life. He desires something way more because he desires to see his likeness in you. He desires to see his attributes and his thoughts to kind of be merged and, and overpowered, overpower your thoughts so that you actually start living like Jesus while you are here on earth. And that is his desire that when Jesus came to die for you, when he died for you, when he resurrected from the, de from the dead, he desires that that resurrection power teaches you and me to live like him. And that's why to see that happen, if we are to really understand what it means to live in the likeness of God, we need to understand that that is where the conversation of discipleship comes out with a strong importance. So, so, so being, a, being a disciple of Jesus is not an option. If you have gotten saved... You and I are subscribing to this thing called living as a disciple of Jesus. You and I are, are, are saying, yes, that I want to live according to your standards, not my preferences. I want to live according to your ways and not according to my ways. And, and when zealous as a community, when we are talking about disciple making, I, I hope you can get this, get this phrase in your head that when we talk about disciple making, we are talking about mirroring Christ. We're talking about mirroring Christ so that the more you and I learn to mirror Christ, the more we will see multiplication happen in the life of the church. 
the more you and I hold on to your preferences, the more you and I hold on to your egos, the more you hold on to the old way of living, that is when you start seeing the death of a church. I hope you can say amen to that as well. You want to you see zealous be killed as a community? Just, just live however you're living without the fear of God, without the love of God, without the commands of God, and within no time, we'll have nothing but more empty chairs and all empty chairs in this place. But how many of you know that that's not how Jesus wants us to build this church? And that's why this conversation of discipleship is so important where we learn the beauty of, of mirroring Christ and multiplying lives. In fact, let me kind of take you back to, to some numbers and statistics the New Testament's favorite word to describe the children of God is a disciple. The word that is used time and over again in the New Testament, this word disciple is used about 270 plus times, whereas the word Christian is used only three times. Now, if you're like, if you're like, a, like you like, taking notes of these statistics, like these things get me excited. So I just, I just put it out there because 270 plus times, the writers of the New Testament emphasize on being a disciple of Jesus. But only three times, it was not the writers, but the people around them in that time who were calling the disciples Christians. And, and I kind of got into reading. It's where Acts 11 is the first place maybe where the word Christian is used. When Luke captured that the disciples were called Christians for the first time in Antioch. Now, now that's on a side note, right? The Greek word that Luke used to, for the word Christian in, in Acts uh, 11 and verse 26, this word... The Greek word actually means belonging to Christ. Can somebody say belong to Christ? Now, now, you and me need to understand that the Greek word at that time, it conveyed a different meaning rather than just belong to Christ. At that time, slavery was existent. Not that it's completely missed out now. It's still there. But at that time, it was prevailing quite a lot in, in the Greco-Roman world. And, and at that time, when somebody used this word, it meant that the concept was derived from being owned by a, the slave being owned by a master. And so in fact, with the word Christian was kind of used in a very derogatory way for the disciples of Jesus. But you know what? They had learned the power of redemption so much, the disciples that you said, okay, you want to call us that? We'll take it because we would rather be a slave of Jesus than be a slave of the world and, and the patterns of sin and the patterns of culture. So the disciples and, and everybody who decided to follow Christ finally gave in to, to being called a Christian, but they did not compromise. It. They were first disciples of Jesus Christ, and then they had subscribed to say, okay, you know what, you're going to call us slaves? We are slaves for Christ. How's that for some perspective when it comes to the word Christian? Uh, Christian at, simply, at that time was another word for a disciple of Jesus. Fast forward where you and I come into picture. The concept of being Christian and then becoming a disciple is completely foreign to the scriptures. What I mean by that is, you may have been born in a Christian home. That does not make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. You may be faithfully going to church week in, week out. That also does not make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. You may have, you may have encountered this place called Zealous and where you, you feel that you belong here and this is where you want to do community. That's great. Please keep coming. But coming to Zealous does not make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. Come on, somebody at least say one amen to that. Amen. Coming to Zealous, coming to, coming to this place called church, attending connect groups does not make you anything. Because this whole concept of just going somewhere and being ticked as a disciple is completely alien to the scriptures. Just because you are born with a fancy Christian name that does not make you a disciple of Jesus. And some of you might have heard this, but allow me to say this one more time that, that a disciple of Jesus is a follower of his word. 
But not every follower or not everybody who claims to be a follower is a disciple. Do you see the difference? And, and, and it's, it's, it's about time, Zealous, that we really understand that, that sometimes the tragedy that you and me get caught up in is that there are many who are enslaved by man-made Christian culture or subculture rather than the culture that Jesus created. And, and that, is the, that is where this conversation about living as a disciple for, of Jesus kind of comes up with so much of urgency because we are so good to subscribing to subculture. We are good to subscribing to things around us. And very soon we subscribe to a subculture in the, in the life of the church which is not healthy as well. And so tonight, allow me to attack that. Give me permission so that I can, I can like, you know, just speak what the Lord is asking us to do and live as his disciples rather just than living as people and just coming and singing a kumbaya and like going home and living as if nothing is happening. The need of the church is to really go back and see how Christ modeled and taught us discipleship. Because like I said, every follower, every disciple is a follower, but not Every follower is a disciple of Jesus. See, the one who says, who claims to be a follower, you can follow from a distance. You can follow from a distance. And then you can, if you get bored or if you, if you give up, you can even start, stop following. But a disciple of Jesus, right, is the one who, who kind of really decides to commit to obey, who decides to walk closely and who decides to model ourselves on the life of Jesus Christ. Somebody say on the life of Jesus Christ. And, and that is what we are really talking about. If you, if you go back and see how Christ taught us discipleship in the scriptures, it is really adventurous. Let me, let me give you an example, right? If you read the Gospel of Matthew, from the, the entire journey from when Jesus selected 12 of his disciples, Do you, if you see that journey, that journey got, got escalated way too fast. I know, I know it's captured about three and a half years of their life, but even in that three and a half years, there's a lot more things that they have done. You see that this, this journey starts with Jesus recruiting these 12 people and then sending them out to do what Jesus has commissioned them to do. You remember, uh, they, were, they were healing the sick, they were casting out demons, they were, they were preaching the good news. A lot of people who were, who were Jews and Gentiles were getting an opportunity to hear the gospel. And, and these guys are regular simple people. We'll come to that, but, but let me tell you this. All that Jesus had envisioned for discipleship, and when he saw those 12 people, it needed genuine faith. Do you agree? It needed absolute commitment. Do you agree? And it also needed the willingness to bear the ridicule, and not just the ridicule, to bear the resistance that was there at that time. Is that true? Now let me tell you, all that you said yes to, these 12 still didn't qualify for those. They did not qualify. So if you thought they were like some, some summa cum kind of discipleships who were like ace in everything, they were not. They were regular people like you and me. And, I, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Yet the disciples, even though they lacked everything, they agreed to one thing and one thing that stands out in all the four Gospels. Jesus Christ was their Lord. Jesus Christ was their Messiah. Jesus Christ was their rabbi or their teacher. And the kind of reverence, the kind of honor that they had for Jesus, you see that in the lives of, Je of the disciples where they just said, teacher, you tell us and we will do it. I'm sure they were like, after they walked away from conversations, okay, what did he just say? But they still obeyed. They still obeyed because something that we need to learn about, about the connection between discipleship and obedience is that your obedience accelerates your journey of discipleship. 
your obedience to the scriptures, your obedience to the nudge of the Holy Spirit, your obedience to the leading of the Holy Spirit really accelerates your journey of discipleship. Now, how many of you have been wanting or have this longing inside of you to really know what a disciple, what a life of a disciple looks like? How many of you have been like really thinking about, man, I, I've been going to church, but why the heck am I spending so many weeks just going and attending church when it's not really impacting my life? Let me tell you this. The call to be a disciple is for everybody. It is for every single person who says yes to the teachings of Jesus, who says yes to Jesus being the Lord of their lives. No one is exempted from this call. Can I say that again? Can you say it to the person who's sitting next to you? Nobody is exempt. The call to be a disciple is for everybody. And, and Jesus has called us to live as his disciples because we are not called to live as his fans. Now, and, and you'll see that, you, you, you'll go back and you'll see that way too much in the, in the scriptures. You know, every time there was a miracle, there was a crowd. Every time there was a truth spoken about discipleship, there were the disciples. And you'll see that time and over again in the Gospels. Now, I don't know if I'm talking to a crowd or if I'm talking to a bunch of disciples. Disciples. Come on, guys. Where's that, where's that conviction? I, let, me, let me try that again. I don't know if I'm talking to a crowd or if I'm talking to disciples. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your grace on Zealous in 2023. Now, if you're a disciple and if you have grown up in church life, if you, if you have grown up in uh, listening to talks about discipleship, what, I'm gonna, what we are going to read together is definitely not new for you. But let's just read it for the sake of this conversation and maybe allow your heart to receive these words with humility and the freshness of this, of this scripture. Matthew 28, the Great Commission, you would have probably mugged it up. Please don't recite it. Just look at the screen and let's just read it together, okay? Uh, this is Matthew 20, uh, 28, verses 9, 19 and 20. Let, can we just read it together? Is that okay? Let's go. One, two, three. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Like I said, this is, this is like some of you, Nenad, I know this man. This, is my, this was just my devotional this morning. This was my devotional last week. And, and, and while, while that might be true, this command is still relevant. 2,000 plus years later, this is still the need of the church. 2,000 plus later, you and I are still called to be a disciple and to go out there and make disciples. And so, so let me sound as a broken record. I don't care, but this is the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ that every single one of you sitting on these chairs has a commission to fulfill. Every single one of you has a testimony that the Lord has birthed in your life. And every single one of you cannot just sit on that testimony and let that testimony go stale. Because Jesus expects you to be a disciple and go out there and make more disciples. But then comes the hard question, right? Then where do I start? How do I do this? Because like uh, all of a sudden Christianity has become such a cringe conversation. Really? Talk to somebody who is in need of love. Talk to somebody who is in need of, 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 of some peace, some sanity. And all of a sudden you'll see that the message of the gospel is attractive. But, but I'm not going to make a whole bunch of assumptions over here for us in this room. But let me point to you from two simple ways how Jesus modeled discipleship for his, for his disciples. How Jesus did. Uh, can I, like last week I gave you three Simple things, right? Find a table, 
stay at the table and learn to lay a table for others. Tonight also I'm just going to leave you with two simple phrases of how Jesus invites every single one of us to, to be a disciple. Now, most of the time we think that when Jesus went on this recruitment drive to, to hire or not hire, to call, uh, sorry hire is the wrong word guys, forgive me, uh, to call 12 people as his followers, we think, uh, we, we said what Jesus would have told them. What's the first thing Jesus would have told them? Follow me. Come, okay. Come, all right. Some of you, some of you are getting this right because one of the first conversations that John captures in the book of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 37. Let's see this, right? These were the disciples of John the Baptist who came and verse 37 says, When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now, how many of you, let's take a pause here. How many of you have started a conversation with Jesus where you really don't ask him the question you want to ask him? Always? Many times? This is, this is one of those moments. Where are you? Now, come on. They, they, they could have just followed him and found out where he was staying. But this is like a conversation starter, right? Like some of you, when you come to church, you don't know exactly what to say to somebody. So, hi, how are you? And then, and then okay, your, your first thing is kind of, you've broken the ice and then it kind of goes on. But this is like, I feel this is one of those things where he, they're saying, okay, where are you staying? But Jesus knew exactly the question that they wanted to ask. And he says, come. He replied, and you will see. And one of the very first things that Jesus used as his disciple-making strategy is come and see. Can somebody say come and see? Come, come and see. This is, this is time and again you'll see this used by Jesus and then later by his disciples as well where he invites us to come and see. Because Jesus was expecting every single people that he was reaching out to just to take that one step in the journey of knowing him. Sometimes I have to say, as Christians, we expect, as, as, as believers or Christians or disciples, we expect people to kind of change overnight. And while that might be the case in some lives, I'm not, I'm not disregarding that. The beauty of Jesus in many cases, if not always, has always been, come on, you say it, come and see. Come and see. He always started where people were at in their journey of life. That's where he met them. And he, he, he met them where, where they were, not where he wanted them to be. He met them where the, at the point of their life where they were broken, they were, they were maybe a, a bit confused, they were maybe looking for some direction, they were looking for some clarity, or they were too tired and too fatigued of everything. He met them where they are. But now, I would be completely messing this up for you in terms of a theological stand, but I just leave you with this, that where Jesus meets you where you are. It's his love that, that brings you to where you are. But let me tell you this as well. He loves you so much that he's going to make sure that you don't stay where you are. And he's going to bring you out to the place where he wants you to be. That's how crazy, that's how contagious, that's how radical the love of Jesus is for you. And so, and so you know, in this, this church life and church talk, he's like, you know, we, we sometimes go and go into this idea and subscribe, hey, bro, like, Jesus met these tax collectors. Jesus met these sinners. Jesus met, you know, these, these people who were broken, messed up. Yes, he did. But go on and read the Gospels a bit more, and you'll see that those, those corrupt people were not corrupt anymore. Those broken people were not broken anymore. Those demon-possessed people were not demon-possessed anymore. Why? Because they encountered the radical power and the love of Jesus that was transformative. So in one season, he met a corrupt tax collector called Matthew. 
In another season, it is that same tax collector who followed him, whose life was changed, and who made sure that he documented every single account of, of the miracles and the life that Jesus lived. So that today, you and me, our faith can be grown. Because you see, Jesus did not leave him in his corruption. He met him in the middle of his corruption, but he called him out with a greater purpose, with a greater love, with a greater desire to be a disciple of the Messiah. And so let's not give in to this false idea, church, that if, you, if you're okay to meet people where they are, please go by all means and do that. The next thing is don't become the surrounding that you're going into. Don't become, don't fall into the trap that, is, that, is, that, is, that might be trying to mess up your testimony or just messing up your, 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 your life as a disciple of Jesus. I'm not saying don't go, I'm saying go by all means, but the grace of God, the power of God, the love of God will give you the wisdom, will give you the right steps to meet people where they are, but also bring them out where Jesus wants them to be. And that is the kind of disciple making that Jesus teaches us. Yes, come and see. That's why the lowest hanging fruit for all of us is to just tell your friends, tell your, tell your colleagues, tell people who you know, who, who you're doing life with, hey, come and see. Come and see. Come and see what I do on a weekend. Come and see where I go and spend my time on Sunday evenings. Come and see how this is really different. And also, I'm not putting words in your mouth if you really believe this. I'm not trying to sell you something over here. But this is the truth that has changed thousands and millions of lives, the gospel. And this is the truth that brings us together as well. And that's why when Jesus says, come and see, in one season he reaches out to a tax collector, in another season he reaches out to somebody who's a loner, a woman with a questionable character. You remember the woman at the well? Nobody wanted to talk to her, so she came to draw water from the well at a time that was convenient for her so that she wouldn't have to engage in conversations. Yet Jesus says, can I have a glass of water, please? And then... Once a questionable woman, once a, once a woman with a questionable character, the next season or the, the next, that same weekend, she is the mouthpiece of the Messiah. And what does she say? Come and see what the Lord has spoken. Don't you see this church? This is one of the most effective strategies or, or help or tips, whatever you want to call it, that is laid out in the Gospels, where you and me, if we say that disciple-making is imperative, if we say that disciple-making is the need of the church, this is how it starts. This is really how it starts. Because the journey of change in many lives starts with come and see. How many of you were invited to church by somebody in your entire life? I mean, not just zealous, but, but any church right? Now some of you are going to be like, Nanad, you have no idea what happened to me in church. Manlia. <laughs> but isn't the gospel what attracted you beyond the person's invite? Isn't the gospel that is the most attractive thing that keeps you grounded? in the scriptures, is in the gospel that is supposed to be a very focus, that is supposed to kind of, you know, really make sure that we start living as a disciple of Jesus. People mess up. His own disciples, his own disciples messed up. But the beauty is when we make it an intentional habit to use this. So I pray that in your lingo that you use, in your vocabulary that you use on a weekly basis, can you insert this phrase as well and try it out this week? Come and see. Come and see. Come and see. See, the beauty of Jesus' style of discipleship, right? Even the disciples did not know what they are going to sign up for. It was, it was like mind-boggling. It was... It was it was good on one day, it was challenging on one day, it was scary on another day. So Jesus was all about surprises because the second thing that he tells us is when you start with come and see, 
And this is this is this might be some this might be a bit heavy for some of you guys who've just started your journey of faith. But it's good that you're hearing this. When you may start with come and see, but then Jesus calls you to come and die. I was wondering what kind of a expression I would get this afternoon when I was penning down this thought, you know, from the church. It was pretty much what I got just now. We start with come and see. Then you move on to come and die. So let me ask you, anybody ready to die? But what about your five-year plans? What about all your security assets and everything that you've been building up for all these years? What happened? Was that? He got, it. he got it? Wow, Raj. So, and, and I'll, like, I'll break this down. So, if you're thinking, my goodness, I need to sign my death will and kind of do all of that. Hold on, okay? Don't make any of those plans yet. But Jesus, in your discipleship journey, there is a point where you are expected to come and die to yourself. To your selfish ambitions to your worldly desires, to the sin inside of you, to the flesh inside of you that distorts you from the plans of God, to, that distorts you from the love of God. Every single one of us is expected. Can I say that? Can you say this word expected? To come and die because of the gospel. I'll give you, uh, I'll give you a few examples of that. Now you tell me if Jesus said this or no. To one, to one person, Jesus says, sell off everything and follow me. Have you heard that? In the scriptures, right? To another, he says, forgive 70 times 7. Have you heard that also or read that? Then he's, to some, he says, turn the other cheek. To other, he says, love one another. Then he says, take up your cross and follow me. And every time, the dis I was just sitting and I was just thinking, the disciples' reactions to all of that, like, Jesus, can you please make up your mind what kind of disciple you want us to be? He's like, all of that. Because in some season, God calls you to turn the other cheek. In another season of your life, God calls you to forgive 70 times 7. In another season of your life, okay, one time there was a crowd that Jesus was talking to. And in a crowd, he ends up saying this. Oh, where's that piece? In a crowd, he ends up saying, uh, will, you, will, you, will you eat my flesh and drink my blood? You remember that one? He said it in a crowd. And I'll also go ahead and tell you something. After Jesus said that, the Bible records, John records that many disciples left, turned away and walked back. What kind of a disciple are we, are we expected to be? So when we're talking about being a disciple, and being a disciple maker, Jesus models these two things so well. Come and see and come and die. But let me tell you how he kind of laid foundation for that. There's a point of time where Jesus worked with this principle. Now some of you might know this. How many disciples did Jesus have, uh, Jesus have? Right? Now, if you know, if you've seen the, the Gospels, if you've read this really well, you, Jesus knew how to really set this up so that 2,000 plus years later, we would be talking about this. Now, you need to understand that though he was a son of God, he was still in human form. Yeah? That's why Jesus started with the three. Who, who were his three closest ones? Peter, James, and John. Moved on to the 12. You remember he's sending them out two by two? 
the disciples to go out and speak about the gospel, speak about the kingdom of God. But it didn't stop there. Once the 12 came back, he, he asked the 70 to go out again. You remember that one as well? And then they came back bearing a great report saying that, Lord, demons are subject to your name. They come back with a great report. And then on the day of the Pentecost, how many people were gathered up in the upper room? 120. So you see the strategy of Jesus. He always focused, not always on the masses. I mean, he, yes, the, the, the gospel records Jesus feeding the 5,000 and speaking from a boat and, and all of that. But coming down to discipleship, coming down to come and see and come and die, coming down to the relational conversation, coming down to speaking life over somebody, Jesus always brought it down to the specific. You want to be a disciple maker? Do you have those three people that you are going after really? And not like trying to sell something to them, but passionately, prayerfully interceding for them passionately, prayerfully speaking to them, really wanting the best for them. Do you have friends? Do you have three people you can put in this list that you can pray for? Do you have three people you can, you can say that, Lord, every day, like, let me, let me kind of make intentional approaches to pray for them. Let me, that you would create an opportunity for me to go out there and tell them, come and see. And then he had the 12 as well. He had the 12 and, and then he expected those guys to also do that. And then he had the 70. Because of, these, because of these 12, they got the 70. And because of these 70, they got the 120. And what I'm trying to tell you is not the num number game over here. But what I'm trying to tell you is that how specific Jesus was when it comes to advancing the kingdom of God. Nothing is random in the kingdom of God, by the way. Nothing is random when it comes to the church and, and we having this call to respond. See, Jesus turned up the heat once again when he told these guys, hey, now you go out and do this. You go out and do this. You know, I, I, was, I was watching uh, The Chosen recently and I think it's season two where, where they capture this piece where Jesus sends out the, the 12 two by two. And you should see this the, the way they have kind of capture this scene, you know, when they're kind of praying for the sick, they're, they're, they're kind of uh, healing the, the demon possessed and the disciples themselves are shocked as to what is happening through them. The disciples are like, in Jesus name, be healed and the person is healed and they're like, wow, like, and, and I was just gone from a, I just went on a different thought process where like, I'm sure the disciples when they started, they're like, I don't know how this is going to happen. Have you ever thought that? I really don't know how this conversation is going to go. Let me tell you, you're not the only one who thinks that way. His very disciples would have fallen into that thought as well. But they still did it. They still went ahead and put themselves out to do it. And, and, and one piece where Jesus talks about coming and dying, he tells them, right, take up the cross. And that's where he's telling them, that's what it means to come and die to yourself. Because the beauty of Christian faith is not living for yourself. The beauty of Christian faith is living for Christ. The beauty of your faith is explored when you put your desires down, when you put your ambitions down, when you put everything that you know about life, you lay it at the feet of Jesus because the life that he's calling you for is a far greater life that is filled with his abundance, is a far greater life that is filled with his perfect peace, not any kind of peace, perfect peace, not any kind of joy, lasting joy, not any kind of desires, but the kingdom of God, the inheritance of the kingdom becoming your portion. That is the life that you and me are invited for. But we will never be able to experience that if we are not putting to death the works of our flesh. We'll never be experience, experiencing that if, if we don't know what it means to put an end to habitual sins in our life. We'll never be experiencing the peace of God if there's continuous chaos that your mind is causing in you because you have not surrendered your mind and your heart to Jesus fully. 
And so, before we go out there and become disciple makers, let's even move maybe a step back, a few steps back and ask, what would it take for us to start living as his disciples on a daily basis? On a daily basis. See, at that time, Jesus had prayed for these 12. That time, Jesus had commissioned them. You would say, you know, Jesus was with them physically so they could do it. Well, guess what? We have the Holy Spirit with us who is, in, who is still operating on planet Earth. Have you forgotten about that? Why? Because Jesus said in, in Acts 8, right? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be what? You'll be my witnesses in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So let me tell you this. Our power and, and, and our desire to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, to drive out demons, it does not come from ourselves. The authority is not your authority. That The power is not your power. It is the resurrection power of Jesus that flows in us and then flows through us by the Holy Spirit. And so that's why when we are called to do these things, we do it under the authority of the Most High God. And that's why we see sometimes when people say that, Ninad, things are not happening in my life, things, my, my, my life is in a mess, I, I, I don't see the point of living for Christ, I don't see the point of doing this. Maybe because you're trying everything in your own strength. How about try doing things according to the expectations of God? you might see things different. You might see things different. Has anybody seen how these diplomats or these ambassadors conduct their life? One of the things that you'll see about the ambassadors that, that, that every country has they themselves have no authority, by the way. But the position that they represent, the, the, the backing of the authority comes by the nation or comes by the power that has, has, has called them to be an ambassador. And, and th I think that's exactly how it works in the life of Christians. You and me by ourselves, we are nothing. We don't have any, any magical instance. Or, or magical powers to do things in the lives of people. But the very God who has called you, the very Messiah who has who's called you to live this life, and the very Holy Spirit who has anointed you, the kingdom of God is backing you when you are stepping out in faith. His presence is going before you to make every crooked path straight. His peace is upon you and His presence and His Holy Spirit will give you the right words when you just step out in faith to help others experience the shalom that you have received. To help others experience the good news that you have received. So let me, let me tell you this, right? Let me close with this. We can never preach in our own capacity. You'll burn out. You can never do things in your own strength for long. You won't be able to sustain it. You'll never be able to be a good witness for Jesus in your own strength because you will fall on your face because that's, we are still living in a fallen world. And that is why relationship with the Holy Spirit is a key to living as a discipleship. To, to live as a disciple of Jesus Christ. You know, there's this time, as we, as we just bring this to a close, there's this time in, in the book of Acts where Peter and John had healed a lame man. And, they, and they, got, they got called into questioning. They got called because they were like, under whose authority have you done this? And, and they're like, they, they kind of take them in, they grill them for some time, and they, they're even kind of considering to, to put them in prison and everything. And, and when the leaders of that time, you know, there were some high priests and everything whose, whose status was offended, whose power was offended, they call them in. And, and this is an observation that they, that they see. But before that, Peter and John are making this classic statement. And in Acts 4, verse 12, it says, where Peter and John is telling them, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage 
of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. That is the key to living as a disciple and going out there and making disciples. If you're always going to subscribe to a subculture church, if you're always going to try and give in to a culture that has got nothing to do with the scripture, you're going to end up living as just mundane Christians who have no real lifestyle and no real commitment of obedience, no real awe of the presence of God. But when we shift our perspective to not subscribe to a, to a church subculture, but to a culture that Christ has asked us to model, where we live as his disciples, where we live as disciple makers, where we go back to the original idea of why Christ even saved you, so that we can reflect Jesus through everything that we do and to everything that we say. So let me close by giving you some touch points. Do people around you feel, say, articulate that they, that you have been with Jesus? Maybe not the exact words, but do people around you really notice something different about you? Or are you as good as another creep that is there in your office? Another person who's always tempered or hot-tempered and, and always kind of using the language that everybody else uses and then when you are here, you're, you're sane, but when you go out there, there's no difference between you and someone else. Is there, is there any tangible, visible marking on our lives that we are living as the disciples of Jesus Christ? That's where it starts. That is really where it starts. And I pray this year that zealous, every pride in us would be broken. Every fear in us would be dealt with. Every despair thought, every ridiculous attitude that tells us we don't need to live as a disciple. May the presence of God convict us and really bring us to that posture. Say that, Lord, I don't want to live as a Christian or a mundane Christian anymore. I want to live as your disciple. Because you can come to church for heaven's sake. Like you can come till kingdom come and nothing will change in our life. But the idea of God bringing this community together has always been that a bunch of radical Christ followers will gather in this place. Whose lives are impacted by the power of the gospel. Are we broken? Yes. Is there sin in our life? Yes. Do we need to deal with things? Yes. But we will not act so cocky that we don't want the word of God to disciple us. We will not act so arrogant that we don't want the counsel that comes from the spirit of God or the counsel that comes from the word of God. So can we just throw out every arrogant attitude that is attacking your discipleship journey? Because for far too long, some of you have been saying, I'm okay with just coming and seeing. But Jesus is calling you also to come and die. And for some of you, you're on the brink of saying that I don't want to come and see anymore. Because I really don't know how to do this. Jesus is still saying to you, my son, my daughter, come and see. Come and see. Come and see the life that I want to give you. Come and see the, the, the purpose that I want to release in you. Come and see the, the, the joy that I want to fill you with. Come and see how I want to change your life. Both, there's a call for both categories tonight. And Jesus is saying, come and see. And Jesus is also saying, come and die. And I was convicted when I was, when I was writing this down today, not because I, I get to bring this word to you, because there are so many areas in my life that I need to allow the scriptures to bring in that rebuke and the scriptures to bring in that, that, that consistent attitude of living as a disciple of Jesus. 
and can I, can i just invite all of us to once again really ask the presence of jesus christ the holy spirit to convict us to soften our hearts to break our hearts to to really mend our hearts to maybe even fix our hearts if you have never experienced jesus christ in your entire life and if this is your moment i want to tell you one of the best decisions you can make is commit your life to jesus and make him the lord and the savior of your life you won't regret that but for those who have been living as seasoned christians allow me to talk to you as well i hope you are willing to humble your heart i hope you are willing to really come before jesus and say god can you teach me can you teach me what it means to live as a disciple one more time can you teach me lord what it means to to live as your daughter can you live can you teach me to live as your as your son i don't want to do life on my own because i'm getting i'm getting i'm getting so clouded in my head i'm getting so clouded in my head god don't you see salvation is found in no other name but the name of jesus christ the shalom is found in no other name but the person of jesus christ the perfect peace the lasting joy his his plans are found in no other place but in the presence of jesus christ and i want to say it one more time to you church stop playing church stop playing with the presence of god i want to close with this one one moment in the old testament where joshua after the israelites had had been in years and years of bondage had walked through the wilderness had come into the promised land and yet they were still struggling with the very same things and Joshua tells them you decide who do you want to serve you decide who you want to follow you decide what kind of a disciple you want to be because the call to be a disciple is for everybody it's for everybody thank you for tuning in for that message we really hope that that has blessed your heart immensely at zealous it's our desire that jesus would meet you at the point of your need and that you would truly grow in the love and the grace that he has to offer each one of us and that's why if you have been enjoying the content that has been coming to you i want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel to share this content with your friends and your loved ones and maybe even consider partnering with us as we take the message of the gospel beyond the four walls of zealous once again it means so much for us when you join in so thank you for being here with us god bless you and may you have a great week ahead